everybody to the Podcasting with Friends Movies Edition. Uh, I'm here with Derek Deal. Hello. And Brandon Bowlby. Hey, guys. What's up, guys? Uh, this week we're going to be talking about uh, the summer movie roundup. We're going to be talking about all the movies that came out in the summer of 2017 and you know, talking about what we liked and what we didn't like about them, going over in chronological order some of our favorites, and then once we get to the end of the episode, we're going to pull out some of our favorite indie movies that came out, too. So, uh, first of all, how's it going, guys? Pretty amazing. Had an awesome film summer. Going pretty good for me, too. You know, coming out of the spring, I think all of us were pretty pretty excited about uh, movies from the year so far. Uh, are you guys still feeling really good about 2017 movies? Uh, yeah, I'm holding pretty strong still. I've, I've seen a ton of great films this summer. Um, some surprisingly amazing blockbusters that I had a really good time with. It was unexpected. But on top of that, also a shit ton of indies that I'm really, really enjoying. And that's going to stick with me until my end of the year list for sure. This year for me was a really exciting summer. I was going to the movies like almost every week. And even though like I keep hearing that this summer actually like underperformed a little bit. Like for me, it's been a really big summer and everything I've seen I've liked. too. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because... Uh, last summer, I mean, I remember seeing a lot of movies last summer too, but a few of them were really, really bad. Like, a lot of ones I was excited about were just really bad movies. X-Men Apocalypse, Independence Day, they were just total bombs. And I think what happened with this summer is that it was pretty easy for me to avoid the movies that I didn't want to see. Like, The Mummy, I didn't see that. And Pirates of the Caribbean, like, I, di- I didn't really care, so I didn't see that. I saw but- it. Unfortunately, <laughs> see Transformers. I didn't see Transformers, but you know it was like easy for me not to see those movies. I didn't feel like I really needed to, uh, but the ones that I did want to see, um, you know, I still went and saw them, and I thought pretty much every movie I saw in theaters was really, really great. Yeah, there was a good movie almost every weekend, like a good blockbuster almost every single weekend this summer. Yeah, with all the recent film news, especially for August of the summer underperforming. Um, domestically, I really didn't feel it as far as quality goes at all. I really think part of that is because people were burned by last summer. People were excited about movies last summer, and people left at the end of the summer saying this was one of the worst summers for movies. And this year is kind of flip-flopped, where less money was made, but the quality was a lot better. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. How many, overall, how many movies have you guys seen so far this year? I have seen 49 films. 49? Wow. Wow. Derek, what about you? I'm just under 50% of where Brandon's at right now. I've seen 24 movies this summer. I'm at at like 60, I think. Jeez. Um, But, you know, Brandon likes to point out that I watch a lot of Netflix documentaries and stuff. (laughs) So so how about we get going on this podcast? What we're going to be doing is going through the big movies that came out over the course of the summer in chronological order talking about what we liked about them, talking about maybe what we didn't like about them. Uh, I think we've got about nine movies that we're going to be talking about, and then we're going to get to the end. We're going to be talking about a few of the indies that came out, and then we'll wrap it up. So um, we already talked about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 in our spring episode. So uh, the first movie that we're going to talk about is Alien Covenant. came out May 19th. It was directed by Ridley Scott. I think that there were some mixed opinions about Alien Covenant. I think Derek was a big fan of it, and maybe Brandon wasn't such a fan of it. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Yeah. So, Derek, uh, before we recorded, you said that Alien Covenant had some of the best aspects of any movie this summer, but also had some of the worst. So, what were some of the peak, high, and low moments for you? We had, like, the first 45 minutes of alien covenant are like i mean i'm not gonna say one of ridley scott's best but it's like a perfect sci-fi opening it's 45 minutes so it's like nearly half the movie it's not really an opening but it's like everything that happens is so just well thought out and it's so like beautifully shot and uh, all the actors are great and i just love like a lot of the ideas they're playing with and i like how much they kept it on the horror side for those first 45 minutes that's like the closest i feel that ridley scott that well anyone really has gotten to uh catching the spirit of the 
first film like in all the renditions of aliens that we've had i don't know that that just felt really authentic and it was so much fun and like I said, it has some of the lowest moments, though, also, because the movie tried to cram in too many ideas, and it didn't quite work out as well as they had hoped, but overall, I still really like the movie, and I stand by those first 45 minutes are, like, perfect. It doesn't miss a beat. I'm kind of with you. I'm, like, halfway with you, because we saw it together, and yeah. I pretty much totally enjoyed it. I remember leaving the theater thinking, people aren't going to like this, Yeah, but... I definitely did. Oh, I definitely liked the whole movie, too. For me, I think it was kind of a misunderstood movie, to be honest. I think it was hardly an alien movie. Like the first, I, I'm with yeah. you. Like the first 40 minutes was an alien movie, but then, really, it's directly a sequel to Prometheus. And yeah. Prometheus was a, an android movie. Yeah. It was about David. And Alien Covenant, to me, is an extension of that. It plays with the same ideas. It goes deeper and broader with the ideas that David brought to the table in Prometheus. And so when people are expecting an alien movie, I kind of feel like they might have been misled because it was much more of a David creation type of movie. I also feel misled with the movie, like you're saying, Derek, being split in half. Um, The latter half being much more philosophizing the first half being a much more original alien and actual scary and action movie um yeah. i think people are split between those and what they liked about it um i'm very much on camp with the first half which is really unfortunate nick because like you're saying i think his intention was to make more of a android movie with that happening so late in the film and being scrunched in at the end with so much content i really felt that's what went wrong and I kind of feel like Ridley Scott was doing what he does best in the first half, and I really did enjoy that. But as the movie went on, I liked the movie less and less, personally. He makes his movies look so good, and he makes his sci-fi look unbelievable. And just like watching Prometheus and Alien Covenant was just a spectacle. And I do, even though it flopped, kind of, I hope he continues going forward, and I hope he finds a way to make it work. Because he's so good with these uh, sci-fi visuals. That's totally true. It was a gorgeous movie. Anyway, let's move on to the next movie. It's time to talk about what came out on June 2nd, the highest grossing summer movie, Wonder Woman. Brandon, how do you think Wonder Woman compares to the rest of the DCEU? (laughs) That's such an easy question. (laughs) I thought you were going to ask me, I thought you were going to say MCU, uh, just because that would be... (laughs) a more in-depth analysis but how it compares to the dceu um it's clearly the best film they've ever came up with um there's not much competition there i pretty much hated everything they've done before i never saw suicide (laughs) squad i probably never will but um, wonder woman was a great surprise i'm i'm sorry i had to ask that silly stupid first question because really the bigger better question is what does wonder woman do successfully where the other movies did wrong uh, honestly, I think like it's really simple. I used to like Zack Snyder a lot, and every time he makes a movie, I tend to like him less. I'm realizing mainly because of Man of Steel and BVS. Yeah, like b- watching both of them, um, it's clear that he he like from Man of Steel, he did not learn what didn't work. Yeah, it's almost like he just ignored everything that didn't work and just doubled down on it in the second movie. They're both so convoluted and, and overstuffed. So, yeah, overstuffed and complex, and they're all structured around delivering these big action set pieces. And Wonder Woman just did the opposite. They just took a step back and they're like, "We're doing this character finally. People have been wanting it for so long. Like in the modern era of superhero movies." how do we just bring this character to life? Like, what's the story we tell? And how do we make that... uh, How do we keep it grounded to where other people... You know, people can relate to it and stuff. Like, you can't... You can relate to Superman. That's the thing. But in the the movies that they made, he's like... He's just like a wooden plank. There's no, like, emotional depth for anyone to grab onto for any of the characters. In yeah. either of those, well, in any of the DCU movies until Wonder Woman came along. They yeah. definitely brought that lightheartedness, but also it's kind of surprising, but they brought like the realism 
to it as well. Like these characters are feel tangible and like they actually exist as opposed to the previous films just being, yeah, they're so dark and they're so dark. Um, that doesn't make it good. And that isn't how reality is all the time. I think what was lacking in the first few DCEU movies was that the characters weren't heroic. They were all dark and brooding and sad, and they didn't really care about human lives, it seemed like. I mean, in BVS, Batman was just, like, mowing people down in his bat plane, just killing people, it seemed like. Yeah, and, that's true. You know, they didn't even, like... You know, they didn't really make a big deal out of it, but Batman doesn't kill people, yeah. you know, and, you know, you can argue that he didn't kill anyone, but, you know, it was like, they don't really have any worry about human lives. It was just whatever. But in Wonder Woman, that was all she cared about. She was, she had these strong, opinionative, often naive ideas of how life should be, and, but she stuck to her guns and she argued for what she thought was right. And for me, one of the most iconic scenes in recent superhero movie memory was when they were in that battle and people were in the trenches and they were losing and they're walking through the they're walking through the, through the trenches and it was like, oh yeah, we can't help these people like the Chris Pratt, not Chris Pratt, but uh, <laughs> the other one, yeah, the other Chris who's <laughs> in that movie. Yeah, he was like. Oh, we can't help these people. And she was like, Pine. "Oh, I can." Chris Pine, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, she was. She was like, "Oh, I can help these people." And she jumped out and she took her took her shield, and everyone was shooting at her. And she held the shield up, and everyone ran out and saved the battle. It was like she was heroic. She was a savior. She was a, a beacon of hope in the world, and that was something that all these other DC movies totally missed. And more just in a general level too. This has the best action of anything in the dceu um yeah. it's it's clear and precise and it just has like a really good fun blockbuster visual style i think there's a really cool quote from uh patty jenkins that um has like been coming up a lot i keep thinking about it when i'm watching newer movies come out especially big action movies and especially superhero movies just because it's kind of you know, it's the same genre. So it was first a magazine, and someone asked, like, this may be a cheesy question, but what do you want people to take away from this movie? She said, did you say cheesy? Cheesy is one of the words I banned in my world. I'm tired of sincerity being something we have to be afraid of doing. It's been like that for 20 years that the entertainment and art world has shied away from real sincerity because they feel they have to wink at the audience because that's what the kids like. We have to do the real stories now. And, like, I don't know, that, that's come up in so, like, even in retrospect, looking at different movies. I know I've seen uh, different people mention, um, let's see, like, uh, Doctor Strange. They have, like, a moment, like, where he dons his cape and stuff like that. It's supposed to be, like, this really exciting moment. He finally puts on his cape yeah. and he's, like, getting ready to save the world. And then, but they're, like, they do the thing where, like, the cape kind of, like, starts, like, tickling his cheek. And he's like, oh, stop that. You know, stop that. I know it kind of just totally breaks, like, the sincere moment we're having where we're watching this hero being born. And it kind of undercuts the entire, like, emotional arc that we have of watching him transform into this person. After just hearing her talk about that, like, it's clicking in my head. I'm seeing uh, how she made her movie, like, following those words. And Wonder Woman is very sincere. That's totally true. I I remember one one moment that I that really stuck on my mind. It's a really small moment. I feel like Patty Jenkins had all these really small moments in that movie, yeah. where in the beginning it was towards the beginning of the movie where she was thinking about leaving. She was trying to leave her island and she was going to go and steal some of the stuff so she could actually escape. And she had to do a big jump. You know, this happens in action movies all the time where you have to jump really far. And so she runs back a ways and she runs up to the top of a hill to like get some speed and she stands there and she takes a deep breath and she looks around and she like sees like a deer or like some animal she just kind of looks at it for a second and it's like this small teeny moment where she just kind of takes a breath and hesitates and then she runs and then does the big jump but it's like you don't really see that in action movies very much you yeah. don't really see that like human little development of taking it all in right 
Go web, go. Yeah. <laughs> Fly web. Fly. <laughs> exactly. Although I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, speaking of Patty Jenkins, uh, this was the highest grossing movie by a female director ever. Uh, do you think this is going to open more doors for female directors? It's tough. I feel like we're in a really cool place right now where a lot of female directors are getting opportunities. Where opportunities weren't. Yeah, exactly. It's part of just like, you know, how the social like conversation is changing. But then if there was any doubt, at least Patty Jenkins has now proven that that is just a complete false idea or statement. Totally. Because she outgrossed all of the other DCEU movies. Yeah, she outgrossed him, and she was the highest grossing movie of the summer. Yeah. Pretty awesome, actually. Yeah, it was really cool. Um, okay, so up next, uh, I think we should switch gears and talk about one of the smaller movies of the summer, uh, a very beautiful, heartfelt movie called The Big Sick. The film by Camille Nanjiani. Is that how you say his name, Derek? Camille Nanjiani. Camille Sorry, I'm bad with punctuation sometimes. <laughs> but um, it was based on his life. And um, if it's okay with you guys, Derek, you tweeted something right after you saw the movie. And I want to read that out loud. And then maybe if you can elaborate on your feelings. Yeah. But um, you tweeted, The Big Sick reaches the balance of comedy and drama that echoes real life in a way I haven't seen captured before. I think this is part of why it resonates with people in completely different situations. It portrays life, love, and heartbreak accurately. I got home from the big sick and immediately wrote four pages about it. I saw my wife being emotionally moved by art in a big way for the first time, and it literally brought me to tears. Thank you both for that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely love the movie. It was just like, I don't know, it was one of those movies that I just had this incredible theater experience like watching you know i've been big fans of both of them for a really long time listen to their podcast and i didn't even know i had no idea about this part like this story about part of their lives why are you big fans of them um they have a really awesome video game podcast um called the indoor kids but then also uh emily gordon helped start up uh the meltdown showroom in la which they've done a lot of awesome podcasts. That's where Harmontown was at for a really long time. Totally. And Kumail was regular on Harmontown for years, too. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah. So they're like indie comedians or involved yeah. in the indie comedian like world. Yeah, exactly. And this was kind of their like big, kind of big break a little bit, like yeah. writing this movie that's about their lives. Yeah, like Kumail's been acting you know, for a while. He's on like Silicon Valley, and he has a bunch of little small parts and comedies all the time but this was kind of like his big move into you know make them making their own movies so i think it has to do with it's got to be like them just just being so honest and them just being very charismatic writers and people in general the comedy goes in this movie it has one of like the single hardest laughing moments i've had in a movie before i think the parents are one of the best parts of this films i got really into both their characters um especially uh, his mother-in-law um oh what was her name again what's the actress name? holly hunter holly hunter yeah holly hunter she did such an incredible job in those few like personal moments um one-on-one -on -one that he gets with her um in the late night scene when they're staying up together is really incredible and it goes such a long way in such a short amount of time in building that connection that pays off big in the end of the movie yeah absolutely and like what i loved about ray romano was that he was playing this dad who the dad isn't funny but what makes him funny is that he's not funny just dad joke after dad joke and just i don't know i fell in love with both of and, them and he knows he's not funny when he says that like <laughs> he's not like the 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 way Ray Romano delivers those lines, like, it's not enthusiastic at all. <laughs> Whenever he, like, tells a joke, he knows that no one's going to think it's funny. Yeah. He's, like, compelled to say it anyways. Yeah. I mean, dad jokes, man. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go on, Derek. What were you going to say? Before? Well, I was just going to say, like, I think what it comes down to is that the movie, like, just truly and accurately and affectionately portrays 
love and life and how both are constant struggle and nobody gets handed a bone nobody it doesn't matter who you are what background you come from it's like everybody goes through all these crazy struggles and it's i've never seen a movie so accurately portray just like how like difficult it is just making decisions yeah on a daily basis the way that they deliver them in this movie all of them are just like so heavy or funny or like you know all this whatever the situation calls for it's and it was surprising how uh, much of an effect uh, all those things had on me well so the movie had such great comedy and it had such real drama um but one thing i really respected about the film is it's like structure all the way through um compared to so many other um what else would you like chick flicks like this or that kind of layout that's usually typical it does things so differently and with the twists it kind of keeps presenting you and even mm-hmm. through the conclusion that kind of throws you a great curveball some people think it goes on longer than it should but i think that just added to its uniqueness and that kind of mm-hmm. drawn out space that happens um after you think the movie might already be over uh i loved the movie for all those reasons yeah it was a great movie i would recommend it to anyone it was had something in it for everybody it was a really powerful movie Anyway, so let's uh, move on to um, another huge movie that came out this summer. I mean, I guess it's not really fair calling it a huge movie because it's kind of an indie movie, but I think it impacted a lot of people in big ways. Uh, I'm talking about Baby Driver. So, you know, Baby Driver is a movie that fires on all cylinders. You know, it's got action, comedy, romance, so much stuff in it. Um, I kind of just want to go around and I think we should all just say our favorite part of Baby Driver. My favorite part? I mean, the, there's so many amazing things in this film. I mean, first off, just like the... the, the when, I, when I'm recommending this movie to other people, the first thing I tell them about is that, like, all of the car chases, everything, there's no green screens in the movie. Right. And so, uh, you know, all the actors are actually in these cars that are flying around doing all these awesome stunts. And they're, it's not all the, you know, the crazy, like, this is, it's kind of like the antithesis to um, Fast and the Furious, like that franchise. Like, it kind of takes that awesome car chases, like loud action scenes, but it brings it down to earth and not so, like, wild and outlandish. But this movie still is kind of like a fairy tale. It, it is. It is pretty I mean, story over the top, wise, but yeah, structure wise, yeah, story and structure. It's like a fairy tale, but uh, yeah, I guess the the car scenes are very grounded. It's kind of similar to Drive in that way. That's that's what I was just thinking in my head. Yeah, it's like it's a mixture of like Drive from like the realistic standpoint, but I also kind of I almost see it as like a a Mad Max Fury Road in like a different dimension. <laughs> like I don't know. That's the, it. It gave me those kind of thrills watching it on the big screen as i got from mad max like just that opening six minute car chase is like one of the most like the most chilling like goosebumps everywhere like i was so i've never been that thrilled (laughs) so unexpectedly thrilled since since that's gonna have to be my favorite part as well i mean you can't beat that opening 10 minutes um up and through the credits i mean him waiting in the car revving the engine when the first song comes on in his earbuds all the way through the action of that scene and then moving forward into the credits with him um in the street kind of the the choreographed musical that is so edgar wright i'm totally with you guys the car chase the car chases were amazing i'm a huge fan of the soundtrack just the whole concept of you know the baby the main character having headphones in the whole time and listening to music pop music throughout the entire movie and it's a pretty big range of pretty big range of pop music they listens to but i just love how obsessed he is about music and it's just like a soundtrack for his whole life and you can you know you I, i've been listening to the soundtrack non-stop all summer just you turn it on every single song is amazing You've got Beck, you've got Queen, just so many great songs. Mm. And there are deep cuts of these songs, too. So just the soundtrack is brilliant. It's like Garden and, State all over again. Yeah, but how they tie it <laughs> but how they tie it in, having it be part of his character that he's obsessed with music, 
and how they do it with he's got the earbuds in the whole time. I just think that's like an iconic thing that I think will go down in film history as you know Baby Driver with those earbuds. So that kind of leads me into another question. So you know one of my best friends uh, is a Subaru salesman and he he actively did not want to see the movie. In fact, we got into a big argument about it and he was turned off by the name. He was he thought the trailer was dumb. And then once I started, you know, you know, gushing about how excited I was about it, he kind of implied that it was you know kind of for film geeks, you know, not really his t- cup of tea. And you know, I was kind of taken aback because I I thought this was a movie that like anyone could like. Um like what? What's your opinion about that? Like, is this a movie that you know that is just for film geeks, or should people who like cars and just like whatever kind of movie go for? As far as um, who's this movie made for? I think it's very much made for both. Um, I think just like what Edgar Wright always puts in his films, he has all those subtle, quick, snappy pieces of brilliance that you can dissect and watch over and over and over again and find more and more detail in his filmmaking um that's there just like it was for scott pilgrim and his films before that but it also is on the surface level it's one of the best action movies of the summer it's one of the best action movies of the year um just like mad max people were helplessly drawn to that um just in how badass it was i think the same thing applies with baby driver edgar wright kind of hit it on all fronts and I think there's proof of that too, because it did pretty well at the box office. It did like, very it did well. It made like a hundred million dollars, I think. Yeah. It almost made the top ten, and then. Well, did it not make it? It got kicked out at the last minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still, it's pretty impressive, especially considering like what his movies have made in the past. That being said, let's move on to our next movie. So let's talk about Spider-Man: Homecoming. <laughs> How do you guys think Spider-Man Homecoming fared in comparison to the other Spider-Man movies and the rest of the MCU? Brandon? Well, it's not as good as Sam Raimi. Um, the second Spider-Man film in 2000... What was it? three, 2004? Is probably the best superhero film ever made. I loved Spider-Man Homecoming. It's actually in my top maybe four uh, MCU films that have ever come out i am a a big fan of this movie and i'm a big fan of it because of its attention to detail um like living in new york i enjoyed how grounded it was in the culture here and in queens and his life and school and home all of it felt so authentic and they got the details right uh just from the opening him filming um, with his cell phone that first five minutes was so funny and clever oh, yeah. and right off the bat I was like this director knows what he's doing but to answer the question you were asking me before uh, I don't think anybody no matter like what superhero film it is can beat Spider-Man 2 and Sam Raimi's original vision for that I think that movie is just almost perfect as far as superhero movie goes but besides that I think it has definitely brought back the character in ways that i was not expecting and i could probably have only dreamed of so i'm super happy about the spider-man and can't wait to see what happens going forward with sony yeah i mean i think what spider-man did for me was it showed me just like when i feel this is like a we're actually in a really cool time uh for superhero movies because i feel like with both with guardians of the galaxy wonder woman and spider-man homecoming they've been able to show us that superhero movies are not done evolving and they're not like hitting a stale point they're being they're all three of those movies were really creative and really different from uh everything that came before them like in their you know for guardians of the galaxy it was guardians of the galaxy one and the rest of the mcu uh, with wonder woman it was you know the other dcu movies and with spider-man it was like totally just introducing a whole new element to the way that these stories can be told by taking that like uh heavy high school uh coming of age story and introduce and combining it with the superhero movie like it was almost more of a like a high school comedy than it was a superhero action movie I think it was you know it was, it was pretty well balanced with both but but having such a strong foot in that other genre 
made this whole movie such a way more interesting and exciting experience. And, yeah, and to piggyback off what you're saying, like I think that what makes all the all three of those movies that you brought up, Guardians, Wonder Woman, and Spider Man Homecoming, is that they're very much based in characters. Yeah. You know, Guardians evolved the characters in ways that you were not expecting. Yeah. Spider Man like nailed the whole aspect of the dual personality of being a superhero and being a high school kid and trying to do both but not really doing well at both. Right. <laughs> you know, there were there were scenes where an action something would go wrong in his Spider Man life and then he would go to school and something would go right in his Spider Man life. And then a few scenes later it would be flip flopped where he would be doing good as a superhero but bad as a bad as a high schooler. And that was one thing that Spider Man really did well at was and something that the Sam Raimi ones did not really do well at all, having that mixture of the two of the two people, the two sides of Peter Parker, I should say. Well, I think Sam Raimi did a pretty good job with that stuff. <laughs> anyway, we should probably move on. So, yeah. um, our next movie uh, is uh, the big Christopher Nolan epic, Dunkirk. <laughs> the thing everyone kept saying about Dunkirk was, you have to see it on the biggest screen possible. So, you know, I want to ask you guys, like, where did you guys see Dunkirk? I saw it in the biggest IMAX theater in North America, I guess, uh, is what I read. Uh, the Lincoln Center IMAX is massive, and I saw it at, like, 10.30 a.m. in the morning on a Friday. And it was, I was so happy I made that decision. Um, it was a great experience. So you actually saw it on the largest format possible? Literally, yes. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I saw it at the Pacific Science Center IMAX, which is, which is pretty big. I mean, it's freaking huge. Yeah. Um, what about you, Derek? That's that's I true saw... IMAX, for sure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it on Untrue IMAX at uh, just a AMC theaters. So I felt like the experience of Dunkirk was was mind blowing. Like it was like a roller coaster. Like I was like gripping the seats the whole time. And it would be—it was like a ride where you would like go up, and then it would drop. Or there's so much action, and then it would like level out, but there was still tension where something else was going to happen really soon. A lot of people have big gripes about uh, the way the film was edited. Um, I figured that's the only thing there is to gripe about. My parents, who don't usually speak about films too specifically. The first thing they texted me um, once I made them go see it in the IMAX was the editing. It did get to them, and they did have troubles with it. And I was surprised that they were actually able to notice that and point it out. For me, however, I guess I was maybe fortunate at the beginning of the movie because guessed exactly what the intention was for the way the timeline was going to be laid out. And so the cutting back and forth for me all the way through, I was it worked and was interesting to me because I kind of knew what to look for um, but I can understand if that didn't happen for people it could be really confusing yeah I mean I actually really liked that part of the movie like that was something that was one of the, the things that I liked most about the movie like it was one of the most interesting things about the movie like that was the way that uh, I feel like Christopher Nolan was able to be heady like in this pretty straightforward movie is like in his editing <laughs> like he was able to like the the timeline and how everything lays out i mean i know for my parents they were kind of bummed that there wasn't more character development yeah. and that was actually again like something that i actually loved about the movie right. i loved that i didn't get to know any of these characters yeah because that's how it would have been like in that moment in real life right you know they're the movie was jumping on and off a boat yeah the movie was about survival it was about just the heat of the moment and doing whatever you could to survive if this was saving private ryan the whole movie would have been the first 30 minutes of saving private ryan it would have been the the opening battle at d-day that would have been the whole thing of dunkirk and we didn't need any of that with dunkirk we just had Chris Nolan decided that it was going to be just just that one moment. You're not going to get to know the backstory of any of the characters. You're not going to get to know what they were like back at home or what their daddies were doing or anything like that. It was just this one thing. And I loved it for that. Yeah, I think it was able to sustain that lack of character development because the movie was an hour and 42 minutes long. 
Um, if it had been a Saving Private Ryan epic of two and a half minutes or two and a half hours of it, that maybe um, could have been way too drawn out with the uh, lack of backstory and the lack of depth in the characters you're watching. But I think it had the perfect pace to pull that trick off. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, those are all of our big uh, summer blockbusters that we saw this summer, pretty much. I mean, I think there was a few other ones that we saw, but we didn't really feel like we needed to talk about them. So I think, real quick, we, we should go through and talk about some of the indies that we saw. Um, so, for example, uh, Oakja. Uh, Netflix original movie that came out. Um, Brandon, do you want to give a little background on Oakja? Oakja is directed by Bong Joon-ho. Uh, he directed, I'm not too big of an expert on him, but I loved his last film, Snowpiercer, is in my top ten. It was one of my favorite blockbusters um, that came out two years, two summers ago, I believe. It's a big turnaround in um, the mood, but I guess not that big of a turnaround in the style. It still has that um, exaggerated quirkiness that was present in Snowpiercer. Um, but I, I really loved this film a lot. This is one of my favorite films of the year. What I loved about the movie was that it balanced like humor and drama and action like all together in a really fun, exciting way. Oh, I was going to add in, you guys should watch The Host if you haven't. It. It's Bong Joon-ho made it before Snowpiercer. Yeah, I, The Host is on my list. Uh, I definitely want to see The Host for sure. I need to see, yeah, you're right. I need to see The Host. Next, uh, we have It Comes at Night. Which was a horror kind of movie um this was a very de- divisive movie i know brandon really liked it and i absolutely hated it um it was directed by trey edward schultz who also directed a smaller movie called krisha which was which was really great yeah i loved that film last year i mean real quick like brandon what did what did you like about it comes at night so i totally get where you and people are coming from uh it was a very challenging and difficult movie but i i loved the way this director um showed his vision of like complete bleakness on the screen i mean it didn't feel good it it hurt to watch but i think just like dunkirk it kind of got in and got out uh just in the perfect amount of time to make the experience worth it for me and the kind of darkness that this movie showed um uh, really, really pulled on my gut, and any movie that can make you feel that way, I think, has a lot of skill involved in it. Yeah, I mean, I I don't mind bleak movies. You know, I don't mind movies that are about the end of the world and don't have any hope at all. It wasn't the fact that it was a challenging movie that bothered me. It was the fact that the movie played with red herrings, where they gave you misdirections, and they opened a lot of doors and gave you no conclusions to anything. And um, I felt like the ending was completely unearned and the director had his vision of bleakness, but he didn't take the necessary steps to earn um, a powerful ending that he was going for. And it kind of pissed me off that he was so dramatic about it. So, um, yeah, I hated that movie. (laughs) All these movies are on my list of movies to watch. Uh, I just haven't gotten around to watch it. Oak just just been, I mean, it's on Netflix. Just been sitting there waiting for you to watch. I just haven't yet. Yeah. Um, one last thing about It Comes at Night. I think regardless of how we each feel about the movie, I think this director, he's this is his second film. Um, his first film, Krisha, was incredible as well in its own way. And I think this guy... Um, is going to be probably really huge going forward and has a promising career ahead of him. He's someone to look out for. So um, I think we should talk about the basically opposite of that movie, A Ghost Story. Which sounds like a horror movie, but it was very much not a horror movie. Um, it was directed by one of your favorite directors, uh, David Lowry. Uh, what else has he done, Brandon? Ain't Them Bodied Saints, which is on Netflix, and it basically has the same cast as A Ghost Story. It's a really small, intimate indie film with um, Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara. Um, It's great. You guys should go see it. And then he totally 
switched gears and came out with Pete's Dragon, um, which was very unexpected. Anyways, uh, A Ghost Story is an incredible film. I think kind of um, this will be probably one of my favorite films of the year. It's a gorgeous, beautiful, quiet um, film that I think everyone should see. It really is a beautiful movie. It's probably one of the quietest movies I've ever seen. But it's, yeah, it's not all a horror movie, despite the title, A Ghost Story. It's very beautiful, and it's more about time than it is anything else, in my opinion. Uh, Brandon, you wanted to talk about Ingrid Goes West? Yes, um, I literally just saw this um, two days ago. Ingrid Goes West is a comedy starring Audrey Plaza. Um, It's kind of a commentary on Instagram and social media addiction we have. Uh, But it doesn't really say the typical things you see on cheesy YouTube videos that tell people they need to get back to reality. It kind of like takes a completely unique and different turn on it and kind of goes more psychological with Audrey's character. Uh, One of the things this film does is it is probably, besides The Big Sick, like going to be the funniest comedy of the year. Like there's points through this movie where I was cracking up so hard. I think everyone should just see this as like a feel-good, awesome comedy. But on top of that, with its commentary, with kind of the way the story goes in the end, and um, it's a really unique, super special ride. Um, I can't wait for you guys to see it. Yeah, I really want to see it. Um, I real quick wanted to talk about just uh, three movies I saw at the Seattle International Film Festival, because all three of them were just totally amazing in their own way. Um, Gook. Was an American film actually, but it was kind of like Clerks meets um, the LA 1992 riots, um, where it was totally about race relations between Asians and African Americans, but it just set in a store, like a shoe store. And the riot is there as a backdrop, but it's not really what the movie's about. It's more about the characters uh, and their place in LA. Um, Another one I wanted to bring up was uh, Nocturnima. And that was one that me and you saw together at SIF. Yeah. Right, Brandon? Yep. And uh, that was about these kids who kind of orchestrated and uh, planned a terrorist attack. Then after they did the attack, they just kind of hid out in a mall. And it's about the, the naive aspects of what they thought they were doing and what the consequences were and i really don't want to say too much about it except that it was a very very powerful movie yeah i agree and uh the third film i want to bring up was called may god forgive us and it was a spanish film basically just about these two cops who were trying to track down a uh rapist murderer it's very powerful very hard to watch at some parts but just totally amazing. I don't know if this movie's going to get a wide release, but again, I saw it, Seth, and I just uh, I was I was moved by it. So yeah, that sounds great. I need to add that to my list. I've never heard of it before. Cool. So we'll be back uh, in a couple weeks with um, our fall 2017 preview, and we're also going to wrap up our summer movie wager and talk about the box office in the summer and kind of break that down a little bit. So. Um, uh, Brandon, where can where can we find you online? Been using Letterbox pretty religiously this year, um, so find me on there just with my name, Brandon Space Bulby. Um, also, I've been starting using Twitter a lot more um, at Beb Seven Two Seven. Derek, what about you? Uh, just Twitter at Chicken Tech and Letterbox. I believe that's at Chicken Tech also. Nice. Cool. Well, I'm Nick Moffat, and you can find me on Twitter at Moffman23. And yeah, I'm I love Letterbox. It's a great social tool for watching movies for film lovers. So you can follow me there. I'm just Nick Moffat on there. So um, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks. Uh, goodbye. Bye. Bye.